Someone who claims to be my sister? What's that supposed to mean? James asked into the silence of the room. On him were the very curious eyes of his three friends, all of whom were apparently exceedingly interested in his conversation. The operator on the other end of the line seemed to be at a loss for words. Well, she says that's who she is, but I don't... They said, trailing off there, apparently not quite knowing how to convey the reasons for their doubts. Funnily enough, it was that exact awkward hesitation that made it click for James. Ah, I get it, he said amusedly, chuckling to himself a bit. It's alright, she is who she says she is. I'll talk to her. And how exactly are you going to do that? Sheeda suddenly commented from across the room, making James look up. He looked at her inquisitively, to which she casually lifted one arm and pointed at the top, still taped over his desk, a sly look on her face. Right, that was a thing. Uh, actually, I'll have to call her back. James quickly corrected himself to the operator. Could you tell her that I'll get back to her as soon as I can? The operator, who was apparently just glad that they wouldn't have to deal with an incident of mistaken identity, gleefully answered. Sure thing, I'll let her know. And with that, they hung up. James looked at the device in his hand for a moment. So, you have a sister, huh? Sheeda piped up again, after James said nothing for a while. How come you never told me? James laughed out loud at that, and asked, Would you believe me if I told you it's a long story? He had to cut their get-together short after that. Or more precisely, they had to move it. His original plan was to take the call in his laboratory, where the terminal was still perfectly functional. But Shida, whose cabin was by far the closest to his, offered to let him take it there instead. And since apparently none of his friends wanted to miss the chance to get a look at someone from James's family, everyone was coming along. It's funny, I didn't even know that we were back in comms range already, Shida commented, while sauntering along next to him, her hands behind her back. Me neither, James agreed distractedly. Must have missed that message. I am going to have to make some calls myself. It has been too long since I've talked to my family. Moore said from behind him. James made an agreeing sound and looked over his shoulder. His gaze wandered from Moore over to Curie, who was quietly going along with their little band. It didn't surprise him that they didn't have anything to add to the subject matter, but it still disappointed him a little. He would have liked to get pleasantly surprised on that. They had reached Sheeta's cabin in no time at all. She took the lead, opening the door for them, and strongly advising, Nobody touches my stuff. Her eyes were focused on Curie, specifically, as she said that. James looked around as he entered Sheeta's domain for the first time. Her cabin looked pretty much like his. A huge bed took centre stage right in front of him. He walked past the separated bathroom. The only thing very different were the models of the furniture items, as hers were obviously imported from Dunima, and not from Earth. He didn't know if it was a Miat thing or a Shida thing, but everything appeared very rounded, the edges flowing instead of rigid, and no sharp corners to be seen on anything. He also marvelled at the material, as, to his eyes, everything looked like it was made of fine mahogany, the wood red and polished. Knowing Shida, he was going to presume that that was just what most wood on Dunia looked like, though, for now at least. While everyone else was trying to find a comfortable place for themselves, James and Shida stepped up in front of the large screen on the wall. I still don't like that they can watch me through that thing, Shida whispered to him carefully. Sadly, they most likely wouldn't be able to take this one out undetected quite as easily as the first one, James thought. He gave Shida an understanding smile, and then focused his attention on the computer. Quickly, he activated it and made the request for communication. The anticipation in the room rose as his request was processed and a connection was being built. Was he really that much of an enigma that something like a call from his sister was this interesting? The tension in the room was almost palpable as he stared at the screen, which indicated that they were waiting for the call to be accepted. With a sudden change, the dark picture was replaced by a bright camera feed, with the sun shining through a window in the background. James recognised the room and the textured wallpaper immediately. They were just as familiar as the dark face that was staring him down now. 
You better have a darn good explanation for making me wait, Nia said in an overly serious tone, wagging her finger at him like a strict teacher from an old movie. I had to find a working terminal first, James explained matter-of-factly, trying his best to keep the smile off his face. Why? What happened to yours? Nia asked, her dark eyes narrowing. Broke it, he said nonchalantly and shrugged. You are impossible, his sister finally exclaimed, and reached her hand to her temple. And boy, you need a haircut. Yeah, I know, James answered, and rubbed a lock of his hair in between two fingers. Nia shook her head, and chuckled softly to herself. In his periphery, James could see Sheeda leaning in towards him, most likely trying to get a better look at the person on screen. He had a good guess as to what was going through her mind right now. However, she didn't quite get to ask the question that he was sure would be coming, because Nia was faster. Who's there with you? She asked, leaning downward and squinting at her much smaller screen, trying to make out James's company. And why are they wearing cat ears? Catching Nia up to everything that had happened since the two of them had last talked during his isolation was a task and a half, especially while having to leave out everything that they couldn't talk about while standing right in front of the computer terminal. You know, of all the things I imagined you telling me while calling you today, I have to admit, I met a cat girl on board wasn't exactly on my list, Nia finally said, looking at Sheeda unbelievably with her hand on her head. I can imagine, James answered, not really knowing what else to say. A moment of bemused silence arose between them as they collectively accepted the craziness of their reality, which Sheeda immediately capitalised on. She stepped closer to James, took another good look at Nia, and, trying to sound as casual as she possibly could, asked, So, that's your sister, huh? James chuckled. And he heard that before. I told you it's a long story, he said, knowing fully well why she would be sceptical of that statement. Where he was about as pale as humans came, with the exception of some genetic anomalies, Nia was almost at the exact opposite side of the human colour scale, her skin sporting a colour close to that of ebony. And while her hair was as dark as his own, his texture was completely different, being thick and curly. Not even in their facial features did they share any similarities. In short, they didn't look like they were related at all, which was understandable, seeing as they weren't, genetically speaking. One I fear I'll have to tell you some other time, James continued his previous thought, as something more immediate came into his mind. It wasn't a nice story to tell anyway. Having answered Sheeda in galactic uniform, he only now realised that him and Nia had been talking in German up until now, meaning that nobody but them had understood a word they were saying, apart from him introducing everyone. He decided to continue in the common language from now on, hoping that Nia would catch on. Uh, enough about me he said, while bringing his attention back to his sister. How are the preparations for your exams going, now that I'm not there to help you anymore? Nia looked at him with a mix of confusion and amusement. Did she have a problem with switching languages? Preparations? She asked with a thunderstricken laugh, speaking perfect GU. James, the exam is already over. Now it was James's turn to look flabbergasted. Over? He exclaimed doubtingly and scratched his temple. I thought the exam was in June, it's only... July, Nia interrupted him with a playfully serious tone. It's July, James. That shut him up. All he could manage to say was, huh, or how about that? The first to see James's dumb stare and realise that he was almost entirely useless for now was Moore, who reacted quickly and, in James's stead, asked, How did your exam turn out, then? Nia sharply sucked in some air through her teeth. Don't quite know that yet. She answered, nervously grimacing. Fingers crossed, though. I think I made it through this time. Here's hoping, Sheeda mumbled, right before elbowing James in the side to snap him out of his stupor. Yep, and if everything goes well, I'll be out there with you in no time, Nia said, clenching her right hand to her fist and shaking it, probably trying to contain her excitement. Within Sheeda's cabin, worried glances were being exchanged after that statement, most of them directed at James. But he wouldn't let their situation ruin something that him and his sibling had been more than excited for such a long time. After all, had she not blundered their first exam, she would already be with them, right at the front line. So he merely confirmed, that's the idea. 
I do not know if we can handle two humans on board. Moore commented chokingly, although James couldn't help but feel that the slightest bit of truth was hiding within her words. That's only because your point of reference is James. Nia quickly jumped on that, giving James a challenging side eye. When I get there, I'll surely have to clean up the mess he inevitably made of our human reputation. But don't worry, we're not all walking catastrophes. Knew it! She'd have exclaimed, framing James a triumphant look. So, you are even weird by human standards. Immediately knowing that he would be fighting a losing battle with both Nia and Sheeta present, James decided not to defend himself. His best option would be quickly changing the subject. Putting on a way over-exaggerated tone, he loudly said, So, how is everything else going on Earth? And clapped his hands once while saying it. Nia laughed for a moment and apparently thought about whether or not she should let him off the hook that easily. Then she seemed to drift off into more regular thoughtfulness, possibly thinking what there was to report. Uh, just the usual, I think, she said distractedly, still looking lost in thought. James knew, had she a pen at hand, she would be chewing on it by now. Maybe he should be more specific. How was Flynn? he asked casually. A high, strange sound escaped near before she answered, He's fine, she said earnestly, just the slightest bit of frustration in her voice, as she looked down and reached for her forehead. He's, you know, being Flynn, I guess. James didn't comment on that. He just slightly chuckled to himself. It was good that he was doing well, at least. Anyone else you want to ask about? Nia asked slowly, almost hesitantly. James slowly let out a long breath through his nose and closed his eyes for a moment. No, not really, he somberly answered, before opening them again. Nia sighed and shook her head, but didn't comment further. At least I can tell everyone that you haven't changed much, she said instead, shrugging dismissively. Again, a moment of silence arose. This time it wasn't immediately broken, so it extended into awkwardness. The one who finally broke the silence to everyone's surprise was Curie. Do you have any feelings? they asked, completely out the blue and not giving any context. Shida and Moore just stared at them, as if they'd forgotten that Curie was even present for a moment, while the humans had two very different reactions. Nia let out a confused, I'm sorry? While James broke out into a snorting laughter from the sheer absurdity of the situation. Once he had regained his composure, he played the translator for Curie, giving Nia the needed context to answer their question. Nia ensured Curie that she was and always had been much more responsible than James, and therefore never needed her teeth filled, which, to her confusion, got the exact opposite of a positive reaction out of Curie, forever amusing James. From that point on, the floodgates were opened, and everyone had to get confirmation on all the crazy things James had told them about Earth. Of course, they all turned out to be true. It even appeared that, according to Nia, James had played down some of the stuff that was happening on the Crazy Apes planet. This went on for some time, with James insisting that he would never purposely spread misinformation. Finally, while letting out a long yawn, exposing every single one of her long fangs, Shida looked over at the clock on the wall and said, James, I hate to interrupt this, but if we don't want to be completely dead for tomorrow's exercise, we might want to put this to an end soon. She was probably right, James thought, also looking at the time. It had gotten really late, relatively speaking of course. Exercise? Nia asked inquisitively. We're getting maced, James reported, quickly adding, don't ask, as he saw Nia's expression change. Well, it isn't your first time, she commented instead. You'll have to tell me if their stuff is stronger than ours later. James nodded laughingly. Sure, he said. Then he put on a big smile and looked directly at Nia. Well, let's talk again soon, he said warmly, the slightest bit of wistfulness creeping up on him with the thought of hanging up on her. It's been nice meeting you all, Nia responded, and they could see her looking around on her screen to try and get a last look at everyone in the room. Can't wait to get to see you in person. The sentiment was returned unanimously, although with differing levels of excitement. It will be our pleasure. Moore said warmly, bobbing her large head up and down. You should focus on making it here first, Shida cheekily commented while crossing her arms. Lastly, Curie just calmly said, I'll be seeing you then. 
Nia and James exchange acknowledging nods and smile for a moment, before simultaneously saying, All right then, bye, as if in a chorus. Then, the connection was cut by Nia. Even though she could not hear them anymore, everyone said some form of goodbye while staring at the now idle computer screen. And for a moment, everyone watched the screen unhelpfully informing them that the call had been ended. Apparently, with Nia gone and them being just among themselves again, all subtlety and politeness went right out the window. Because once everyone had uselessly confirmed for themselves that the conversation was, in fact, over, Sheeda turned to James and shamelessly asked, So, who's the adopted one? Sheeda! Moore exclaimed outrageously, her massive hair shooting around to give the feline an appalled look. But James was much more amused than he was insulted. The true answer would be neither of us, he answered honestly, while fighting back a snigger. But the answer you're looking for is... she is. Although, even though we grew up together for the most part, she was never officially adopted by my family. She is my sister in spirit only. Sheeda made a sound of understanding, even though her puzzled face showed the exact opposite. James ordered the screen to turn off with a passing gesture. That must indeed be quite the story, Moore commented, her claws slowly gliding through some of her fur, and James could swear that he heard a hint of romanticised raving in her voice. He feared that the memories he had of their childhood didn't quite match up with the fantasy she was brewing up in her brain. It is, he said a bit bashfully, scratching the back of his head and gazing into empty space. Then he shook his head and drove away the melancholy, focusing on the people around him again. But like I said, now's not the time for it, and Sheeda is right, the two of us should probably get some sleep before we go through the ringer tomorrow. Moore, who seemed to have missed the expressions changing on his face, nodded understandingly. Well, I do not envy you, she said ruminatively, her mind now probably wandering towards the most certainly painful experience awaiting her deaf world of companions. I shall take my leave then. I wish you the best of luck. James nodded, while Moore made her way towards the room's exit. When the gate had opened, Moore turned around one more time, and added earnestly, If you should need me, let me know. Success to you. James nodded, as everyone in the room half-heartedly echoed, Success to you. Then Moore vanished out of the door. While it still remained open, James turned to Curie. We should go too, he said. Do you know what you'll do for the rest of the day? Curie shifted their weight around a bit while looking at him. Is your laboratory unlocked? They asked after a moment of thought. It is, James answered. Then I will go there if that's okay, Curie stated looking at him, and patiently waited for his confirmation. Be my guest, James responded, supporting the statement with a welcoming gesture towards the door, indicating Curie to take their leave with him. But when they scuttled past him towards the hall, and he took his first step after them, Sheeda reached out to him, stopping him in his tracks. Actually, she said diffidently, making intensive eye contact once he had turned towards her. James, do you think you could stay just a moment longer? I have something to discuss. James looked at her quizzically, wondering why she had waited for the time everyone was leaving to bring it up. He glanced over at Curie, who had stopped for a moment, and shrugly indicated for them to go on ahead. Curie's expressionless face inspected his for a moment before they turned and also left the room. They closed the door behind them, filling the room with the loud mechanical sounds for a moment before it fell silent. James turned back to Sheeda and gave her an inquisitive look. But instead of addressing him, she started to push him forward. For a moment he thought she would lead him to the exit, but then she made a turn and came to a stop where they stood in the corner where her room's wall met with the one segmenting off her bathroom. He just kind of let it happen to him, all the while looking at her with the same questioning gaze. Finally, with a last look over her shoulder, Sheeda took a deep breath and said, So, what did Nia mean by, it isn't your first time? In the same breath, she had let go of James and started to sign. I couldn't talk about this in front of the others. I actually didn't want to even tell you, but I have to. That thing is always watching me. It's driving me crazy. It took James a moment longer than it should have to get what she was talking about. When it finally clicked, her eyes followed the direction of the gaze she had thrown over her shoulder earlier, landing on the other corner of the bathroom. Had it not been there, he would have been looking directly at the computer terminal. Right, he says slowly and also raised his arms. 
On Earth is part of the training with stopping weapons to have them used on yourself so that you feel their effects. It's supposed to prevent you from using it lightly. Meanwhile, his hands were busy signing. Yeah, I get that. Sadly, there's not much we can do about it right now. Thinking back to a lesson from back on Earth that he wished he had learned much sooner, he quickly added, Or do you just want to vent about it? Shida shook her head, her hair rustling around her tired face. Of course you do, why didn't I think of that? She said with what was supposed to be a mocking tone, but a bit of her distress managed to seep into her voice. Feeling unobserved now, her body language had changed. She stood almost completely closed up, her rears and tail hanging, and her limbs kept close together, the exception being whatever she had to use her arms to sign. I know that is just very taxing, she signed, her gestures looking slow and tired. Her sunken in form immediately appealed to James's ingrained instincts, and before he could stop himself, he reached out and pulled her into a hug. Inwardly, he regretted that. Even though she looked a lot like a human and had gotten much less adverse about being momentarily touched by him, this was overstepping boundaries. But Sheeta didn't squirm in his arms. In fact, she didn't move at all. She just let her head sink against him and quietly stayed like that. Softly patting her on the back, he let her rest like that for a moment. Only when he slowly let go of her did she raise her head again and step back. She must have seen the worry on his face because she quickly gave him a snort, encouraging smirk, before her expression went back to one of exhaustion. I'll be okay, stress just brings back some unwelcome memories, she signed, not bothering with covering their conversation with a verbal one anymore. I just think that I may need some space from it, just for a little while. James could definitely sympathise with that, and he really wanted to help her out, but in the heat of the moment, the obvious solution didn't come to him. So he asked, that's understandable, but how? Shida looked at him with a mixture of shyness and a hint of disappointment. Despite that, she did not hesitate. She slowly asked, do you think I could spend a night at your place? James's eyes widened a bit, as it hit him just how dense he had been. He had to restrain himself from smacking his forehead, instead just reaching for it and inwardly reprimanding himself harshly. You just had to go and make her spell it out for you, didn't you? He scolded himself. I thought you were better than this. Since there was nothing to be done about that now, he quickly shook off that thought process and brought his attention back to the conversation at hand. Still a bit dazed by everything, he candidly asked, Is that allowed? He remembered the long list of rules of conduct on the ship, but couldn't remember anything specific about sleepovers of any kind, mostly because he never thought that anything like that would apply to him. There's no rule against it, Shida responded, which didn't entirely answer his question, but it was good enough for him. Honestly, he had asked the question more out of reflex than any real concern. It wasn't like breaking the rules would suddenly deter either of them. Then sure, he replied joyfully, feeling relieved that he would actually be able to do something to help instead of just lending an open ear. He could see on Sheeta's face that she most likely had expected this to need more convincing than that. They awkwardly stared at each other, neither of them quite knowing what to say. Great, then I'll just, um, Sheeta said verbally, since what they said now didn't need to be hidden anymore. Right, um, so should I wait, or? James asked hesitantly, pointing with his fingers between the door and the room. Sheeta made a contemplative sound. Just a moment, she quickly said, hurrying away from him and towards her cupboard. She rummaged through it for a second, making a mess of multiple stacks of her clothes before grabbing out what to James looked like sweatpants, or maybe even leggings, even though the material they were made of didn't look right, and what he expertly identified as one of the cropped compression shirts she also wore during training. The clothing items in hand, she rushed into the bathroom, leaving him alone with his thoughts for a moment. He wondered why she was in such a rush since they had plenty of time. He rationalised it by thinking that she probably just wanted to get it over with before things got the chance to turn awkward again. If that was even close to the truth, he may never know. Just a very short time later, Shida burst back out of the bathroom, the fresh clothes still slung over her shoulder. Alright, let's go, she said, and James was just willing enough to oblige her. Walking the way between their two cabins for the second and third time today respectively, 
they didn't dawdle, and quickly reached James's living quarters. When James had unlocked it and once again haphazardly kicked the piece of toothpick into the room, Shida immediately went past him to once again rush into the bathroom. Closing the door, he stepped over to his cupboard in order to, with much more care than Shida had done, take out his attire for the night. He didn't have to search though, grey sweatpants and t-shirt it was. He quickly changed right on the spot and neatly put his uniform to the side, seeing as it was still relatively fresh. Shortly after he was done, the bathroom door opened and Shida came out of it, carrying a big, white, yellow bundle. Apparently she had rolled up all her dirty clothes into her uniform jacket, which she now laid down at the foot end of the bed. The black cropped shirt fit tightly around her upper body and left most of her arms as well as her stomach and lower back exposed, which gave him a good look at the dark stripes covering her skin. The pants were indeed somewhere between sweatpants and leggings and were made out of a crimson, sort of velvety material that in James's head didn't fit with either of those garments. It looked cosy though. He looked at the scene for a moment. The first thing he realised is that he had severely understated the size of his bed when he had called it king-sized. It was by far large enough that multiple people of his size could sleep in it without even having to touch each other, so if the two of them wouldn't have to interact if neither of them didn't want to. Shida stood in front of the massive piece of furniture. Earlier she had occupied it without a second thought, but this time it seemed like she had some kind of foreboding feeling while looking at it. James decided to give her some space and opted to now take a moment to follow his evenly hygienic route himself. When he emerged again, Shida was still standing at the edge of the mattress and looking like a small child during their first time on a diving board at the public pool, staring down into the deep end. His intrusive thoughts were telling him that he should remind her that this had been her idea. His answer to that was a resounding, or oh, how about I don't do that? Instead, he decided to just roll with it for now, walking over to the opposite side of the bed and just getting comfortable. Only once he had found a suitable position for himself, did he look over at Shida again? She still seemed hesitant. However, even if he wanted to help, what he was definitely not going to do was try to coax her into getting into his bed. No, not even he would go that far. This was something she would have to decide for herself. After looking over at him for just a moment more, Sheila commented, I thought you don't like the heat here on board. And finally, she started to climb on top of the mattress slowly crawling over it on all fours. I don't, James said, taking his eyes off her and nestling his head into his pillow. And yet you still get under the covers? She asked with confused amusement, crossing the empty space between them. Without removing his head from the cosy position it now found itself in, he answered, I need that to fall asleep. And even then, I still have a hard enough time with that. With a bouncy, puffing noise, she just head fell right next to his, Close enough that he could feel her warm breath as she sleepily responded, You're crazy. Turning his head only slightly to look at her, he replied, I thought you knew that already. She hummed in acknowledgement and rubbed her face against his, releasing a long-lasting purr in the process. Deep down, James knew that he definitely did not have the social skills necessary to deal with this situation, as his subconscious set all kinds of alarms within his brain, most of them related to anxiety. Luckily, he wasn't an overwhelmed, pubescent teenager anymore, and had long learned to deal with said alarms. Instead of freaking out, he calmly ordered the lights in the room off. In the darkness, he could feel Sheeda laying next to him, crossways across the covers, and her face still right next to his. Well, enjoy your night out of sight, he jokingly whispered right into her ear. She again confirmed, with just a hum, and scooted even closer to him. He could now feel the vibrations her purring caused reaching his body, and parts of her hair touch his face. Yep, this would definitely get a lot more complicated in the near future. He could tell. Oh, screw it, he thought, and leaned into her, the two of them now cuddling out to each other just the slightest bit. And quickly as never before within his memory, he drifted off to sleep. The next day in the fitness area, the loud voice of the security guard in front of him said very clearly, now, remember, this cannot kill you. It was a big man, looking like a goat had gone stuck halfway during the volume from reptile to mammal, his body covered in colourful feathers instead of fur, while otherwise displaying ungulate traits. Just douse me already, this isn't my first rodeo, James answered, keeping his eyes shut tight and folding his hands behind his back. 
not far from him, he could hear Shida loudly curse, while it sounded like her soul was trying to leave her body for her air rays. She had taken to the chemical assault much less kindly than to the electrical and physical ones they had to endure earlier, retching and coughing from its effects. All right, be ready, the guard said, and shortly after he could hear the hissing noise of pressurized gas being released, directly followed by a wet sensation on his face. Immediately, he could feel the burn on his skin, as the different receptors within it detected the assault. It felt different from pepper spray on Earth, although his mind didn't have the capacity to discern in exactly what way right now. His logical mind told him that it most likely wasn't capsation they were using, at least not entirely, since any avian would have been almost completely immune to that. But his airways didn't care much for the exact composition of the mace. In only seconds, he could feel his mucous membrane swelling up and going into overproduction. From experience, he knew that it was easiest if he kept his airways as clean as possible. And his instructor in the military had ingrained one wisdom into him. There's no indecency when you got maced. Unashamed, he coughed and spat out the bodily secretions, trying to close up his airways clenching his teeth with the pain. Somewhere before him, he could hear the security guard again, who was now coughing and rushing himself. Apparently, he hadn't used the weapon correctly, and stood in the splash zone. He quickly realised that the composition actually did matter, since the effects were honestly pretty tame compared to the memories he had of Earth's version of a chemical stopping weapon. After some time had passed, he could hear somebody approach him, and he leaned his head back. A cool fluid was poured over his swollen eyes, and he could immediately feel the relief it brought with it. Right away, he noticed another factor of the different components of the spray. These ones lingered far less. Either that or their neutralizer was much better than the stuff they had used on Earth. How are you still standing? The security officer who had sprayed him earlier asked from a few steps away. Through his slowly returning vision, James could see that the man was also covered in the same neutralizing fluid as he was. I only took some residue and it felt like I was burning up. James tried to blink the mist out of his eyes and still had to rid his lungs of the remaining mucus accumulation within them before he could answer. I told you, it's not my first time. He decided to keep the part where the pepper spray on Earth was a lot more potent to himself. He looked over to Shida, who was sitting on the ground, breathing heavily, and looking very displeased with her situation. Her face was completely reddened from the agitation, and her hair and uniform were dripping wet from the neutralizing fluid. Her ears twitched and she apparently noticed that he was watching her, and she turned her head towards him. Laboriously heaving herself off the floor, she said, Well, you can enter pain tolerance on your side of the scoreboard. This sucked. Agreed, James said, and cleaned his nose with the sleeve of his uniform. It would have to be thoroughly cleaned anyway. A loud clapping sound resonated through the room. Captain Uton was apparently ready to address his security team again. As they had nothing to do with it, they slowly skulked over to some towels, which they had prepared beforehand. Silently, they cleaned their faces and at least somewhat dried off their hair. It was a good thing that Udon had at least had the foresight to put the chemical option at the end of the exercise, so that they could go wash and change as soon as he was ready to declare it to be over. So, what's your verdict on today's exercise? Shida asked while annoyingly putting on some parts of her wet uniform that had started to stick to her skin. Overall, not impressed, James answered while trying to blink the last bits of haziness out of his vision. The different kinds of stopping weapons of the crew's security had indeed done a remarkably poor job of stopping him most of the time. The man catches they were equipped with were too large and unwieldy to effectively pin him with. The non lethal ballistic rounds had felt more like paintballs than like rubber bullets. Their energy cousins didn't do much better, plus, they actually had problems with piercing his clothes. The tasers, probably with consideration towards less hardy offenders, weren't strong enough to actually make him fall. That just left the mace, which had admittedly been painful and blinded him, but if he really wanted to hurt whoever was using it, he probably could have still done so. But maybe we should keep that to ourselves. Shida looked at him confusedly, wordlessly asking, Why is that? James glanced around for a moment. It didn't seem like anyone would be close enough to eavesdrop on them. Leaning towards Shida, he whispered, This may just be me being paranoid, but I think the timing of the captain wanting to train security to go up against death orders right now feels a bit suspicious to me. Yep, Shida said, and threw the used towel over her shoulders. You are indeed paranoid. James wanted to retort when he saw Shida's eyes fixate on something behind him in the distance. What's up? he asked. Reprieve is here, she answered, 
her face turning contemplative as she tore her eyes away from the adverse officer. James had to suppress the urge to shoot around and take a look for himself. What? Why? He asked, keeping his eyes pinned on Cheetah's face. I am literally surrounded by security. I even have my assistant with me. He looked over to the place right next to the wall where they had put their assistants for the time being, in order to keep them safe from the assault they would endure. No idea, Cheetah answered, bringing a finger to her chin while thinking. And of course, a very special thanks to our lovely Petty Officer Sheeda and Mr. Oldman, who have so graciously volunteered to be of assistance in today's training exercise. Some jubilations are in order, if you please. The loud voice of Captain Uton bellowed through the air, followed by astonishingly genuine sounding cheers from the guards. A bit too happy about getting to torture us there, guys, James commented with a head shake. Many of them probably wanted to do that to me for a long time now, Sheeda responded, her face telling James that she was already scheming her revenge. And with that, our time together has reached its end for today. I hope you all learn something and are ready, should the day ever come, when you have to put your knowledge to use. The captain continued his speech and sank from his upright position back down to all fours, his tail curling upwards into a spiral. I will see you all soon. He saluted, causing everyone in the security team to take up their speech's various respectful positions. Finally, she had groaned, and she and James walked over to the wall to pick up their assistance before they could get out of there. Yet when James had just picked the small device off the floor, Uton, who had not left the area as James thought he did, walked over towards him. Mr. Aldwin, may I have a word with you? He loudly announced himself. If the captain of the ship wanted to talk to you, it wasn't a request, so instead of giving a useless answer, James turned towards the huge man and said, Since when am I Mr. Aldwin to you? Uton made that low, barking chuckle noise of his before he answered, I just wanted to try and sound like a human for a moment there. How did I do? Knees work, James replied and grinned at the captain, exposing his teeth demonstratively. Right, the smiling, the captain said, his tone still amused, but now turning a bit more businesslike. Anyway, petty officer, could I borrow the dear scientist for a moment? That also wasn't a request, so Shida just took up her respectful position for a moment before taking her leave, throwing a last glance back at James. James looked after her for a second, before turning towards the captain and facetiously saying, So, what can I do you for? It was the casual tone that Udon had most likely come to expect of him by now. Uton, who had looked after Sheeta for a moment longer than him, turned towards James, his face a weirdly serious grimace, giving James pause. James, serious question, he said, and in what was a very human-like gesture this time, he sat down, pressing his hands together in front of his mouth before pointing them at James and making eye contact. Did you sleep with my officer?